fish breeders that make the most money, they generally do it on racks. Here's how to set up your rack the right way to maximize profit, maximize the species you can keep, and minimize the amount of money you're dumping into. There's a few key points here, so follow along, save this to your phone. Now, if you've already invested in a rack for your fish, it means you're already a little bit further along your fish keeping journey than most. Your idea is vertical space in opposition to keeping a tank here, a tank here, and a tank here. Smart move, but a rack is a considerate investment. So naturally, you wanna make the most bang for your buck from that situation. You've gone and put the money out. Now it's about optimizing everything you've got to get the most breeding action going you can possibly make. It's important to differentiate between breeding and growing out your fish. If you've bought this rack to grow out your fish, different things are needed. This video right here is specific for people who want to breed as much as possible. So having the whole rack covered not always the most important thing. What you're looking for is lots and lots of small tanks so that you can separate your species in your breeding project. That's why I always opt for divided tanks. Not only do they look awesome, they do the job for you. You're not sitting a two foot by a two foot by a two foot with a small viewing window. You can optimize them. So this is a three foot tank with a divider down the middle. There's lots of viewing space. So you can see what's going on. I value the viewing space over having as many different species as possible crammed into your rack. A, weight limits, and B, you tend to be able to breed more efficiently if you can see what's going on in your tank. You miss less problems that pop up in your tank and you can get on them quicker, which generally means more breeding over and over and over. So if you haven't already gone and bought a bunch of different fish tanks for this project, get yourself some divider tanks. The next thing you wanna look at is your working room. So this is something that most people that get started and are really gung-ho, they overlook it. So you can see here, there's a decent distance of space here, and that's for me to be able to reach my arm in and do things to the tank. A lot of people will set their rungs lower than I normally do, and then realize, oh, it's really annoying to work on this tank. You wanna make sure that the accessibility of your tank is really, really high, because otherwise you tend to not want to reach your hands in the tank anywhere near as much. And every time you decide not to work on a tank, is a potential opportunity missed or a potential problem in your tank that doesn't get resolved fast, sits there and it festers and that can sometimes spell disaster for your fish. So before you even put the tanks on the rack, measure it out, measure the height of the tank and then measure how much working space you've got. 200 mil, perfect. For you, as long as you can reach your arm in, do things and you're not having to like really bend your body to get your arm in and it's annoying, then you're optimized. Me personally, I'll put my highest priority fish on the top and middle rows. Bottom row for me, I'll set up two foot tanks and I'll stack them side by side by side. I can generally fit five two footers sat down there comfortably. The other important reason why I always put those two footers on the bottom is because of bowing. So if you overload your bottom rung, there's generally a little bit of bow that'll occur. That's just natural. Even if you're under your weight limit, there'll be a little bit of bowing that happens. What you're trying to do there is because it's on the bottom rung, you can easily put supports in that will hold or help hold the weight of those tanks. Plus five extra tanks means five different species that you can start breeding as well. The next thing, this is before you even put tanks on your rack, is to make sure your rack is level. Everything else works off of that and you're sweet. Once you've done those three things, then you can start putting tanks on and filling them up, getting them ready to cycle. A lot of the beginners that try to go really fast at this stage they tend to cram a lot of stock in the tanks while the tanks are still only just establishing their biological strength. So your tank can be cycled, but it may only be able to handle a few fish. So you've got to play a balancing act and take it nice and slowly. You'll see here there's only three fish in this tank. That's because it's cycled. However, I wanna slowly ramp it up to having more and more fish in there. Now we all know the heartache that happens if you cram too many fish in a system that's not strong enough to handle it, you'll experience a tank crash and no one wants to see that. So take it easy. I know you really, really wanna get into it now, but the longer time you take, the more established or the more set up for success your system, your breeding rack actually is. So if I'm really trying to optimize the amount of money that I make back from a rack system or a breeding project, I make sure that my fish start at about $15 value to be sold each. So that A, I'm not risking huge amounts of money at the start while the tanks are still establishing. And B, I can slowly climb the value of those fish up 
when I slowly start trusting the tanks. So it's less of a gamble, more chance you're gonna make your money back and then more chance you're gonna keep going in the positive. So I'll start with species like Neocaridina shrimp, expensive guppies, pygmy cories, or bristlenose variants that sell for higher prices. And then I'll slowly work my way up to the expensive L number pleco and things that will sell for 30 or $40 a pop. This might be obvious to you guys, but the important thing for me about having separate tanks is that there's no water flow between the two tanks. So a lot of people will have baffles or grates that the water can flow easily between the two. The thing that I've noticed is that fry, baby guppies, just small shrimp, little fish can actually swim between the gaps between the two and they'll get predated by whatever's on the other side. So I make sure that it's a completely closed ecosystem that can help me control the tannins in the water, the heat, almost every single part is totally controlled because it's a separate ecosystem. That's a very important part of having your breeding system absolutely optimized. So there's absolutely no water flow between here and here. Same with down here. Now you'll also notice, I hope you can notice, but it's very, very clear water up top and then it's a bit darker or tinted down the bottom. That's because I'm manipulating the environment in those tanks to match where the fish breeds the most. Now, obviously that's up to you, the species of fish you're keeping and the way you wanna breed them, but do your research and it will help you tweak and tailor how these fish love to breed and how you love to keep them. And as time goes along, you can sort of crack the code on different species of fish. And you just keep doing that in that specific tank, keep those good things happening, and that will end up being a quiet money earner for you. That little tank will be a money earner that just keeps going and going and going as long as you keep that habitat healthy. The next thing, and this is really important because you can either throw money down the drain doing this or you can save a lot of money by having your rack in the first place. Generally, setting up a rack the right way can save you $500 in your energy bills, which pays off the rack over the course of a year by manipulating the heating and the filtration. So you'll notice in this tank here, or in all of these tanks, I'm running sponge filters. One air pump runs this whole fish room and an air pump doesn't cost that much to run. If you've got separate canister filters here and here and here and here, you're running each of the pumps and that's gonna clock the money up. As well as heating tanks individually, if they don't share a common wall, is gonna be a little bit more expensive. But I'm gonna keep my hot tanks up top. These are gonna be 28 to 30 degrees. I'll run two heaters, don't get me wrong, but those heaters won't be running anywhere near as much as if they were separate two different tanks because the heat from this tank is sharing the wall and is subtly heating this tank and vice versa. That's gonna save you money. So my advice for you, get a big strong air pump, maybe one that does like a pond and run sponges in all of your tanks. If your tank needs more filtration for some reason, you can always pop a canister on and let it run, but this is gonna drive down your energy costs over time and you'll find it's a bit easier to keep. The one caveat to that is the tanks get a little bit more dirty, but you should be paying attention to your tanks anyway. If there's lots of fish waste lying around, you wanna make sure that that's sucked out. Now, I hope this video helped. You can go right ahead, set your rack up, get your tanks ready, make sure that bad boy is level, fill them, cycle them, add everything nice and slowly, set everything up so it heats well and you're preserving energy as much as possible so you can get as much ROI as possible from your breeding projects. If I've missed anything, let me know in the comments below. And if this video helped you, follow or subscribe to this channel because there'll be more videos coming very, very soon.